Now I'm going to try to get you interested to my PhD thesis, which is about a curious robot learner for interactive goal babbling. So it's about building a system so that it strategically learns by choosing what, how, when, and from whom to learn. Or in other words, you have a learning agent who will choose the content, the procedure, the timing, and the source of its learning process. So the background of my work is that we would like to have learning agents or robots for lifelong learning, which is about learning tasks in an open-ended and evolving environment. And so the challenge of lifelong learning is that you have limited resources. For instance, you have a limited lifetime. And on the contrary, you have a huge search space. The environment and the world you live in is infinite. So the idea, if you want to, our idea for learning is to design a something strategy using social guidance and autonomous exploration based on artificial curiosity, also called intrinsic motivation. So, which means that from that idea, we build a unified active learning algorithm architecture for the learner to decide on those questions of what and how to learn, but also on what, when, and whom to imitate, maybe. So as I said, we would like first to set the background of our work. So we wish to enable agents to learn during their lifetime, so as to adapt constantly to the open-ended and changing environments. And one good example of a successful learning agent is, well, human babies. During their development, we can observe that they choose to focus on different objects or activities according to a developmental sequence. And the question is, how come that in this blooming and buzzing confusion that is our open environment with so many things, objects, and people moving, how do babies still manage to learn and improve their skills? And what are the principles that make them focus on certain toys or games or activities in an ordered manner? And likewise, the child decides to interact with social partners or not, and when they would like to interact with them. So the same question goes, how do they decide on which principles do they decide when and whom to interact with? So uh, we will now analyze this behavior from a learning perspective. How could these choices be made related to active learning for multitask and lifelong learning? So as, uh, we will answer to these questions by analyzing how we can sample an open-ended environment and high-dimensional environment for lifelong learning. So um, we're mo mostly con interested in robot control and motor control or mo robot control is about learning a probabilistic distribution uh, P of B given A. For instance, for a child who learns to fish, this would mean that he would learn the relationship between the outcome of uh, its actions, the, the position of the float of his fishing, and the movement that he has to make. So in this example, B would be a policy, and A, the position of the float of this fishing rod. For learning such a probabilistic distribution, the agent has to sample uh, the spaces B and A. But in our real world, B and A can be continuous spaces <laughs> and of high dimension, so you have a very large search space. The mapping between B and A can be stochastic, so repeating the same policy can lead to different outcomes. But it can also be redundant, in, uh, so you can to reach uh, outcome A2, you can perform different policies here. There's also problems of inhomogeneous, inhomogeneity, 
you have uh, unlearnable spaces. For instance, if you're in front of a lake and you are fishing, then you can only reach areas that are around you and points that are two kilometers far away, you can never reach with your fishing rod. The same way, um, you have problems of unboundedness, meaning that you have a limited number of training data only because you have a limited lifetime and to learn you have to make physical experiments and each experiment takes time. Therefore, guiding activity data collection can maximize what can be learned within a lifetime. For learning complex uh, motor skills, so several modes have been developed. The first of one, the first of them is what we call socially guided exploration mode, which takes a so as source of information a social partner, a teacher, a mentor. So an appropriate co robot controller can be derived from observations of a human's own performance of this uh, controller. So in terms of imitation, you can see two different behaviors. Uh, the first one is in mimicry. Here, the child is mimicking the, the elderly sister. She tries to copy the posture and the uh, positions of the fishing rod. So, when you copy a policy, uh, this can be defined as mimicry. Whereas in this right hand picture, the small uh, little girl is trying not to copy the posture of the sister but to reach the same point outcome as the teacher. And this kind of trying to reproduce the same outcome as a teacher is called emulation. In terms of social guidance, several algorithms have been developed. One of them is, for instance, programming by demonstration that has been developed by the yard. The advantages of this is that demonstrations uh, enable um, to highlight efficient localities in the search space of uh, policies and outcomes. But the problem is that you have only, you are very dependent on the teaching data set, which can be sparse and uh, suboptimal. So the teacher may give you not enough demonstrations, and maybe the teacher is not so good at the task he wants to teach you. You also have correspondence problems, meaning that the teacher and the uh, learner don't have the same bodies. Robots are not built like humans. And the uh, problems are in dynamics and representation of movements that cannot, uh, can be uh, different. Lastly, uh, most of those uh, methods for social guidance have been developed only uh, to reach one single goal. So you teach to reach one point and then you have to do again the whole process to try to generalize it to different goals. Uh, the second mode is uh, what we call autonomous exploration, which takes as source of information oneself. So what, uh, the person experiments by himself and uh, Methods like reinforcement learning or goal-oriented learning of inference models have been developed and proved efficient. These methods have the advantage of enabling autonomous exploration, which is independent of any human effort. And the learning is adapted to the agent's own body, which means that that you don't have correspondence problems. Then a few methods have been developed for multitask learning and have proved efficient. But they ha still have problems when uh, the explorable space is unbounded, especially the outcome space. So to sum up, we have two kinds of methods that use two kinds of source of information and our idea is to try to combine those advantages in a single system so to use social guidance and autonomous uh, exploration to learn a mapping between a b and a space so you learn the mappings and uh, you can experiment either by yourself or try to observe 
uh, teacher who does um, a policy and then you can try to repeat its policy or by mimicry or you can try to emulate when you observe a um, teacher making a certain outcome, then you can emulate that um, and reproduce that outcome. So the idea uh, here is that you have a system that can uh, use both modes, so which can decide which something mode you would want to use. But this active learning um, principle can be applied to other levels to decide which teacher you want to learn with how to imitate um, if you want to imitate or mimic sorry if you want to uh, mimic or emulate so if you want to imitate or decide yourself on the outcome or if you want to imitate the policy or devise your own policy and in the same way if you do autonomous exploration you can either decide on an outcome you want to use and also decide which policy you want to perform so this these questions can be answered with active learning. Um, so, um, so methods of active learning have um, enabled exploration um, to maximize expected learning progress as, um, and to uh, evaluate that empirically. And this leads to a meta-exploration problem addressed with like, the bandit algorithms. So um, in uh, our work, we use intrinsic motivation for active learning. So um, intrinsic motivation, also um, referred to as um, artificial curiosity, is defined as the doing of an activity for its inherent satisfaction rather than some separable consequence. When intrinsically motivated, a person is moved to act for the fun or challenge entails rather than because of external products, pressures or reward. So this theory developed first in psychology uh, has been applied uh, for uh, robot learning with active goal babbling, which has proved efficient with the development, for instance, of uh, algorithms like sag RIC. So we'd like to use uh, the same principles to build a system to learn multitask, for having active choice of outcome to produce, and uh, to be able to deal with high dimensional stochastic continuous search, search spaces. So now I'd like to first illustrate this idea on a very simple example, and then I'll later on develop on other more complicated environments. So let's say that uh, you're in front of a table and a teacher uh, uh, puts an object, a cube, on this table here. And he says, okay, by the end of the day, I'll come back and uh, I want you to have learned how to recognize this object. Uh, if I put this object in other positions and orientations, so what would you, can you do to better learn this object with its different positions and orientations? One answer is by manipulation. So you can push the object so that it goes into different positions, or you can lift and drop the object so that it falls down in different positions, or you can also ask a human to manipulate the object. So the question here is, if you want to do active learning, is which manipulation will bring you more useful information about the object? And if you have not only one object, but several objects, then you also should decide at each moment which object you want to manipulate. So you have uh, several objects here. We have uh, the robot learner, this iCup, who can um, take this uh, ball and lift it and drop it. By manipulating this way, uh, the object will land in a different position. So it will generate a new image of the object so get more information about it. Um, so if we put that again uh, mathematically, we are learning here a probabilistic distribution P of B given A, where A is a set of images and B a set of objects. 
And with regard to um, the uh, decision, active decisions that we make, we're making a decision of which manipulation or which something mode you are using. Um, we don't decide which user we want to use because there's only one in our experiment. But we also decide which object we want to uh, manipulate or have the uh, teacher manipulate. So yeah. We have here two questions. This, how to do it, could be very simple in this case. It can be summed up in this two-dimensional table where you have different objects and manipulations. So you have to decide at each point of time which of those combinations you want to choose. And our idea, as I said, is to have active learning with intrinsic motivation based on competence progress, which has proved efficient for learning goal-oriented exploration. Um, so the idea is to have a measure, which is the competence at recognizing the right object in image A. So if I have an image here, am I able? to recognize it uh, as a cube. And we measure this competence empirically. Um, so for instance, we begin randomly, because we don't know which is the best option, by pushing cars. We push it once and twice, and we see that uh, the competence is increasing through time. So this is a plot of competence through time for each of those. But if we ask a human to show us a cube, then we have a certain competence and a second time it doesn't move. So the idea is that we'd like to choose the one where we make the most competence progress. So we choose more to push the car um, stochastically. And as it increases, the, the slope then again decreases because you have learned everything you sh should know about the car, then you your competence is very high, but the competence progress then decreases. As it uh, decreases, then you stochastically sample other combinations, and it turns out that at this time, maybe human interaction uh, with the cube gives you more competence progress, so you choose this one more, and so on. So to um, build this system, we designed an algorithm called uh, SJM X which is an algorithm, algorithmic architecture for hierarchical learning on two levels. Uh, first, it selects the object and the something mode that it wants to use. If it learns by uh, interaction with the teacher, it will request it uh, to the teacher who will show an object BJ. And by showing this object, it will generate an image as input to the robot, which is AR. And you use your recognition uh, algorithm to recognize it as an object BR. And the difference between the real identity of the object BR and what you thought it was will give you the competence measure of how well you could recognize BG. And this will give you the measure to fill in that table of competence interest mapping and to compute the progress so that at the next time step, you can better decide which object or something mode you want to use. Now, if you want to do an autonomous exploration, it's more or less the same principle. This time, you decide again which object you want to use. So yeah, you decide yourself by G, and by ma doing the manipulations for yourself, you generate an image, which you recognize as VR, and the difference between those two gives you the competence at recognizing Basically. We'd like to test if our algorithmic architecture, SJMX, can choose something modes for online learning. And the second question is, would SJMX be robust to bad teachers? So we conducted uh, one experiment with the iCloud to recognize five objects, which are the car, cube, ball, bear, and dog here. And we plotted the recognition level, the F measure, how well it recognized with respect to time. So each of the, those color plots correspond to how well it recognizes and discriminates each of those objects. And when we use the 
algorithm SJMX, we can see that it learns and the recognition level increases. If we use the same recognition algorithm but with a random sampling of object and, and mode, then uh, we can see that yes, it learns, but the levels are lower, especially for this object, which is the cube, which has a lot of uh, col different colors, so it's difficult to, to uh, recognize. Below this uh, graph, we have uh, plotted the chosen object, so with each color corresponds to which object it was uh, trying to manipulate. So it looks like a really unordered choice, whereas in the case of SJMS, we can see that there's more structure, and especially in the end, it focuses more on the cube. So somehow the robots recognize that the cube is difficult object to, uh, to learn, so it focused on it. So we can say that SJMX learns better than random sampling and uh, guiding data collection does improve performance. Now, uh, what about a uh, different teacher? So we made an another experiment with what we call a bad teacher where in this time the teacher always presents the object with the same position and orientation so he doesn't give every time new information to the robot and as expected we can see the, that the recognition levels are lower especially for the cube but in the case of SJM at in the end it still learns whereas in the case of random sampling it stays really bad so uh, we can say that SJMX is robust to the quality of social guidance. So having said that, we tested this uh, idea of active learning with intrinsic motivation and with several data sampling modes. And it seems a good idea, but what if we are faced with a more complicated probability distribution in a continuous and high dimensional space. <clears throat> and this is what we try to address in this second experiment. We have a uh, fishing rod here. Sorry. Okay. That can uh, move. So it's a six degree uh, freedom arm that can put its floats anywhere on this surface. This is the surface of the water and this is the view from the camera which is on the top of this same surface. So we can see the position of the float and we can also see, not here but from time to time, um, white spots which are the goals that uh, it has to reach. Oops. So, sorry. So with random exploration, actually, uh, most of the time, the robot will not even reach the surface of the water. It will have the float suspended. But from time to time, it can reach uh, one point. But it can also benefit from human demonstrations. Here, the demonstrator shows one demonstration, and then it can try to imitate this by replicating and then it can reach points that are close to that demonstration point here. Which means that when you ask the system again to when you evaluate the performance of the system and ask it to reach different points that are on uh, that are randomly put on this surface then it can reach uh, points that it knows but for instance, it's points it can't reach, and because of the demonstration, it can reach better this point here. So uh, we use the six degree of freedom robot arm, which is controlled by twenty five dimensions. Uh, these twenty five sorry, these twenty five parameters define uh, the basic curve of the target trajectories for the. Uh, which are which is the target trajectory for each PID controller of the of the of the motors, 
which means that the policy space is 25 dimension and uh, the outcome space is the so surface on the floor which is a two dimensional space yeah. so we are learning to um, have a probabilistic distribution between p of e and a so given the position of the float which dynamical that movement should you perform to reach it in this experiment we use two something modes which are imitation and self-expression but just in this experiment, the uh, learner didn't actively decide which mode to use, it was pre-scheduled. He only uh, actively decides on which area of the surface he wants to sample, so which position, outcome he wants to, to reach. Yes. So this can be uh, summed up as uh, active learning, so he can learn either by social guidance or autonomous exploration but it decides on outcomes and policies to perform, whereas in the imitation mode, he doesn't decide on what to do. So the algorithmic architecture we made for this is called uh, SJMD, for Socially Guided Intrinsic Motivation with Demonstration. And here again, we have two modes. In the social guidance mode, we can have a teacher who makes a demonstration, and with the correspondence, it means that you have access to a demonstrated outcome and a demonstrated policy. You can emulate the demonstrated outcome and also mimic the demonstrated policy. And when you reproduce this policy, actually you reach an outcome which is AR. And the difference between AD and AR can give you a measure of how well you were able to reach um, a AD. So this is a competence measure which can, you can use to, to estimate how interesting this outcome was to reach. Uh, on the contrary, if you are doing some ex autonomous exploration, then you decide by yourself a goal that you want to reach. And you, from that uh, goal, you decide yourself which, which policy you are going to use to reach that goal. So in our um, experiments, we used uh, the Neldermid algorithm for non-linear optimization, but it can be re replaced by uh, any um, algorithms like genetic algorithms or other optimization optimization algorithms. So when you produce this policy, then actually you reach outcome AR. And the difference between AR and AG gives then again the competence at reaching this outcome, which then helps you to decide on the next step which outcome you want to, to focus on. So we are now still doing the experiments on the real robots, but for for a first step, we had conducted the experiments with a simulator, which is given here. So the simulation environment is stochastic with non-uniform stochastic distribution. So in this, this is the part of this uh, surface of the water, which is the outcome space. And uh, each color corresponds to several points that were, were reached by doing the same policy here, or here is a different policy. So you can see that uh, it doesn't reach the same point. The, the environment is stochastic, but you also see that the shape of those points is really different from one policy to the other, which means that uh, there's non-uniform stochastic distribution. So to evaluate, as shown in the video, we uh, set a few benchmark points so uh, these, these are goals that uh, we asked the robot to try to learn and we will measure the distance, how close it can reach each of those points. We also have a human who demonstrates how to reach all of those points. So the demonstration set is sparse and it's meant to be somehow uniformly distributed on the virtual space. 
the demonstrations were given. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Um, by kinesthetic, so you have the uh, simulation environment and the real robot here, and so a human person can use the robot to control what is going on in this simulator, and then uh, see what which outcome is reached by the policy that was demonstrated. Also, to assess the to assess the the performance of our algorithm, we try to compare it with several other sampling nodes. So the baseline is a uh, random sampling where the agent selects random policies and learns with a learning algorithm. The second one is called SAGRIC. It's an algorithm for uh, learning with intrinsic motivation and with goal-oriented something uh, which has been proven to be quite good in high-dimensional and continuous spaces. The third kind of some uh, learning is through observation where you have access to one demonstration of the teacher at a regular frequency. It is different from imitation in the sense that imitation has the same access to this demonstration but after the demonstration the learner would try to repeat by himself this policy with small variations. So SJMD is somehow a mix between imitation and uh, side RIC. So he would have access to one demonstration and then try to imitate it and then switch back to Saga RIC autonomous exploration until there's a new demonstration, etc. So our question is, can SJMD learn to reach all the goal outcomes better than these algorithms? And could it learn faster? Also, for which outcomes does SJMD improve the agent's performance? And the fourth question is, could the, these results be scalable to a larger outcome space? So we conducted experiments and plotted uh, the, the, the mean error with respect to time. So this is the mean distance to all of those uh, goals on several runs of experiments. And this is time. And you can see that the red plot, which is the error of SJMD is lower than all of these others, which means that SJMD learns with better precision. You can also see that the variance increases and is uh, smaller than with autonomous exploration, which means that SJMD can also learn more reliably than SAGRIC. And the error is lower from quite the beginning, which means that SJMD learns faster than the the studied algorithms. In terms of outcomes that the agent can reach, here we plotted it uh, same. This is the outcome space, which is two dimensional, and we plotted the histogram of the outcomes that were reached by the learning agent. So red means that this area has been reached a lot of times, and blue means that they have scarcely been reached. And uh, this is the center of the position of the robot. So you can see that whereas in random something, uh, the robot mainly reaches points that are just in front of it. In Saga RAC, the explored space has increased a lot. And in SJMD, it has increased even more. So I have put crosses which correspond to the demonstrations of uh, the teachers. So this shows that SJMD increases the explored space and uh, ex explores more uniformly the reachable space, including the isolated subspaces. So what about uh, larger spaces? Uh, in the second set of experiments, we use a larger outcome space, so 100 times larger. Mm -hmm. And again, we put it on the, uh, on the outcome space. 
here um, the go in this time we plotted the histogram of the goals that the robot set for himself for itself so we can see that uh, this seems to be more fuzzy distribution whereas in the case of SJMD the robot has set goals that correspond better to the reachable space so somehow SJMD learned where the reachable space is so um, we also plotted um, the mean distance with respect to time and again the red curve here which corresponds to SJMD is lower so um, it learns faster and with better precision and also a little bit more reliable than Sagar IC. Um, so even in large spaces, SJMD is um, is robust. These plots uh, show that uh, SJMD learns faster uh, than random exploration, um, imitation learning, or uh, Sagar IC. And uh, it all can learn to produce a wider variety of goal outcomes and can be scalable to large goal outcome, outcome spaces. So. But uh, the question, two questions remain, which is how is the performance as of SJMD dependent on demonstrations? And second, what is the role of demonstrations? So for that, we try to analyze how sensitive it could be to correspondence problems. So uh, we use a second teacher. So we have the first teacher, which is teacher three, who is the human teacher. And we also used uh, another teacher, who, which is a robot that has learned with Sagar IC and now gives demonstrations to our new uh, learning agent. And we plotted for each of those teachers the performance for SJMD and learning by observation. So you already know the plots for observation and SJMD for teacher three here. And here we plotted have the performance when the robot is learning by observation with teacher one. So you can see that it learns better, the error is lower because both teacher and um, learner are robots, so they have fewer correspondence problems. This means that you should expect that SJMD with teacher one would be lower, but actually we found out that um, it has somehow the same performance as SJMD and even it's a little bit better with the um, human teachers than the robot teacher. So this means that performance is little sensitive to a small correspondence problems in some measures, but also we wanted to investigate why teacher three would be better than teacher one in this case. So we tried to look at the human demonstrations as such, and we plotted here, so the the joint angles with respect to time for each of those demonstrations. So each line corresponds to one demonstration. Um, and these are the angles of joint one with time for teacher one and the human teacher. And we can see that it's strikingly have a kind of um, structure here that is visible. And uh, uh, another analysis shows that those demonstrations of teacher, the human teacher do not come from a random distribution. So we can say that the human demonstrations are structured differently from other random demonstrations. And the robot learner could uh, take more advantage of those demonstrations. The third question we investigated is how robust it could be to suboptimal or sparse demonstration sets. So we have the two uh, teachers, one and three, and now we have teachers four and five, which are actually subsets of teacher three. So four is demonstrations three that are behind, that reach points behind the robot, whereas demonstration five are points that reach points 
outcomes that are in front of the rewards. And again, we plotted the error with respect to time. And yeah. So you already know the, the curves of random exploration, SJND with teacher 1 and 3. And now we plotted for teacher 4 and 5, which are here. So you can see that there's a difference and teacher 4 seems to be better than teacher 5 for the learning agent. And this comes from the fact that uh, teacher 4 would enhance more exploration than teacher 5. Here teacher 5 makes the learning agent uh, explore only uh, areas that are in front of him. But teacher 4 encourages the learning agent to explore also behind it. So SJMD is sensitive to demonstrated outcomes. But uh, in both cases, uh, it still learns, despite the quality of demonstrations and the scarcity of uh, the demonstrations. So we can conclude from this set of experiments with uh, the fishing rod that demonstrations structure and orient the exploration of policy and outcome space, whereas autonomous exploration makes it robust to the sparsity of demonstrations, the relevance of demonstrations, and with some correspondence problems. So, uh, we have devised an algorithmic architecture for online learning of inverse models in continuous high-dimensional robotic sensory motor spaces to learn multiple goals and generalize over a continuous ensemble of goals, and to actively choose online goals to learn. So we reuse this algorithmic architecture <coughs> for trying to model and understand child development and more precisely development of vocalization. So, yeah, so in this experiment we try to have a simulator of a vocal tract that the a learning agent can control the motors of its vocal tract and to produce sounds. So it's learning a probabilistic distribution that maps between motor commands and the sounds that it can produce. And in this example, we have a system that can decide which sampling mode to use, also which sounds it wants to try to produce, and from that, which motor command it should use to reach this. This uh, leads to a few results where we show that through autonomous leveling there's an emergence of three stages where first of all it makes, even if it moves its focal tract, it makes no connection, then it makes some kind of noise that are unarticulated and then only it makes articulated sounds that sound like syllables. And if we ha put the same learner in a social environment with uh, sounds that it can try to emulate, then we show that it shifted from the beginning phases where it only explores by itself to phases where it tries to emulate the ambient sounds. So we show that there's a, a double evolution from no articulation to articulated sounds, but also from uh, autonomous exploration to imitation. And these correspond to uh, descriptions that have been made in uh, infant development of vocalization. So um, from this perspective, this learning pro process makes the emergence of a structure in the learning process. And this corresponds qualitatively to the developmental sequences observed in infants. As a conclusion, I'd say that uh, we try to have a system that discovers uh, its environment and tries to structure its development. Uh, we developed uh, three kinds of algorithms to explore uh, different combinations of active learning. So the first uh, algorithm is SJMT, which combines both social guidance and autonomous exploration, but it's um, 
it's active learning corresponds to the outcomes that it wants to produce and it also decides on which policy it wants to use. This has been illustrated in the fishing experiment where we showed that it, this paradigm can learn as well or better with, uh, or with better precision more reliably and better and faster than the other sampling models we considered. It uses demonstrations to bias uh, its search in the policy and outcome spaces. It uses self-exploration to overcome correspondence problems. And it uses self-exploration also to compensate the sparsity of the demonstration set. In a second, uh, algorithmic architecture is SJMEM, which I didn't present here, but it's SJMD with another choice of which sampling mode to use. And we applied it to the fishing experiment, but also another experiment with the air hockey. And here we have a system for interactive learning, which decides when to interact or not, which self adjusts its timing for requests for help to a teacher, depending on the cost of the request. And it was tested both on a deterministic and stochastic environment. And finally, we have the SJM ads, which could decide which sampling mode, which teacher to use, either to imitate or emulate, and also which outcomes it wants to focus on. So we presented the results for the ICOV in um, discrete spaces for the vocalization, but we also tested it in another system where there are many kinds of tasks or outcomes it could produce, and, and also several teachers. So we showed that this algorithmic architecture is a system for interactive learning with several teachers to learn several types of tasks. And we tested it both in continuous and discrete spaces, but also in simulation and physical robots. And we also tried to use it to model child development. So we realized a sys uh, learning system for that automatically selects the most adaptive mode of something for a given outcome but also the best teachers to show for outcome it wants to reach, but also that can discover by itself the easy, reachable, and difficult uh, outcomes. So as a whole, the algorithmic architecture of social guidance with intrinsic motivation can discover the properties of the physical and social environment and use it to structure its learning process into a developmental sequence. So we contributed in terms of interactive learning by devising a first a system that combines social guidance and intrinsic motivation. We also have the first instance of a strategic student learner with a system that actively chooses with the same principle, the content, the timing, the procedure and the source of its learning process. We have advanced in lifelong learning by having a system for multitask learning with online choice of various things. And this active choice based on intrinsic motivation can explain the emergence of uh, developmental sequences. So there are a few perspective extensions that we can make to this uh, work. So to cite a few, in our work we use context, outcome and poli policy spaces that are predefined by me, the programmer. But it would be more interesting to have a self-discovery of those spaces. And this is related somehow to my current work now. Also, in the works I presented, the sampling modes are static and preset, but we could consider that those modes are learned to and can evolve 
uh, through, for instance, communication or social interaction. And thirdly, we have defined uh, policy spaces as uh, a space of a certain dimensionality with the maximum complexity. But a uh, really interesting work would be to build macro actions or options to have more complex policies and so that the system can accomplish tasks of increasing difficulty. So thank you very much for listening until now. And this is short list of some publications.